Hello and welcome to As It Comes, life from a musician's point of view. I'm Davina, I'm a freelance cellist based in London, and today I'm having a duvet day. Yay! I'm not kidding. I'm currently recording this sitting on my bedroom floor wrapped up in my duvet. Or oh, Duna, if you're from Australia, g'day. I'm a toasty, snuggly burrito. It's a recharge day, which everyone needs. Nine to fivers are lucky enough to usually have this on a weekend, but mine coincides with a Tuesday. Bit weird. You know when you've been out of the house all day and your phone runs out of battery and you start freaking out because it's on 1% or something? It goes all dim on low power mode and you're frantically trying to find somewhere to charge it? That is illustrative of my life and I'm sure many other musicians and freelancers. Instead of looking for a PowerPoint, you're searching your diary for a day off. Living off caffeine and rando sandwiches, making stupid mistakes. It's like when your phone buzzes saying, battery low, connect your phone to a charger. It's your body telling you, go to sleep. So last night, after a day where I'd woken up at 5.45, don't ask, I turned off all devices and went to bed at, get this, 9.30 and slept for close to 11 hours. And I feel great for now. I'm trying not to think about the train I booked going up to Glasgow in a few days' time, leaving London at 5.30 a.m. Honestly, it seemed like a good idea at the time. Will my recharge day be enough to get me through then? We shall see. If you see me wandering around aimlessly and quietly, then you'll know I've switched myself to airplane mode. So apologies if no transmissions are received during that time. My guest this episode is Mike Ladisser. He's a composer and orchestrator working on the faculty at Royal College of Music and University of Cambridge, as well as orchestrating for TV and film, including Ad Astra. We chat about what led him to create and release an album of his own original work, the vinyl revival, and what an orchestrator actually has to do to prepare for film recording sessions. I met up with Mike the day after his birthday, and we start with a bit of microphone geekery chat namely my need for pop filters. For those who don't know, pop filters are those circular things that sit right in front of a microphone. You might have seen them in pro studios. They're supposed to eliminate that rush of wind whenever you say a P or a plosive like this. P -p -p. So the reason why you're hearing this is because I don't have those and I need them. It's annoying, isn't it? P -p anyway, here's my chat with Mike. <laughs> You know what I need to get? I need to get those fancy pop filters that they have in studios. You could make a makeshift one if you just get like a ring and put some stockings over it. A ring? Well, quite a large one, right? Just whatever. Enough to cover the space between your mouth and the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> you could use some sellotape and some stockings. Some stockings. Okay, so I think I do have a pair of tights that have got holes in them. Can yeah. I cut those up? Perfect. Does that work? Yeah. Have you tried it? I haven't tried it because I don't have stockings. Oh. Never have. <laughs> but you could also do the same with the sock. Oh, okay. Yep. I've done that. Mm -hmm. Is it sort of like teenager garage band? You know, you're makeshifting everything. Mm. And when were you in a situation where you needed to make your own pop filter? When I was like what, maybe 13, uh -huh. recording our band for the first time. It's like one of my... Teachers in college had said when we were talking about microphones, there's like the famous SM58 from Sure. Yeah. That is, uh, he's like, I think this comes, um, you know, in every 12 year old boy's uh, birthday <laughs> <laughs> presents is delivered. Anyone who's interested in music, this is their first thing. Wow. Wow. I'm a bit sad to say I don't have SM58s, but yeah. It's, you know, the design has been the same for so long because yeah. it just works. I'm obviously not a 12-year-old boy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy with these microphones. Yeah. Can I just first of all check, what's the pronunciation of your surname? Ladisser. Ladisser. Is the Americanized version of a French-Canadian surname. It's French-Canadian? Yeah. Oh, how would you pronounce it as a French-Canadian? I probably won't do a good job, but <laughs> la douceur. That sounds really nice. Because it means the sweetness. Oh, so fitting. We've, we've we've got your we've got your baklava here and yes. your Persian dates, which I might tuck into. First of all, I'll just say welcome to the podcast, Mike. Thanks for having me. Thank and you for having me. Offering these delightful sweets. 
which I believe you got for your birthday. So happy birthday. Yes, thank you. How was it? It was yesterday. I'm sorry I didn't wish you happy birthday on social media. That's absolutely fine. Uh, it was great. I wanted a very chill day, especially after my, my album thing a couple months ago. I felt like that was my birthday party All with right. everyone. And so I just wanted to hang out, go to a pub, and just relax. Like a true sort of classic British experience. Yes. Yeah. Any good pubs around here? We're in West London. There is a very good one down the canal, the Italian job. Uh, <laughs> they do very good Italian pizzas. Excellent. And they they have actual Amaro. So Amaro is like the post-dinner digestive mm-hmm. uh, kind of liqueur. And uh, they have a selection. It's quite rare to wow. find that in London. Because I imagine you'd usually just find one and then stick with that. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty cool. And how's your head this morning? Uh, was fuzzy and now much better. <laughs> <laughs> Hence lack of breakfast this morning. Yes. <laughs> That's brilliant. Well, happy birthday for yesterday and thanks so much Thank for you. speaking to me today. So as you mentioned before, you had an album launch in late August, which you very kindly invited me to. And just to set the scene for listeners, it was at the Hospital Club yes. in Covent Garden. And we went into the function room and... Uh, everyone had a drink and got to look at the artwork that's affiliated with the album. And then there was another separate room where everyone was given a pair of headphones, a la Silent Disco, had the album streaming through their headphones and they could walk into this immersive sound experience watching footage from NASA. So I made the bespoke visuals from both... Uh, animations from NASA of like space photography and either, you know, animations that they had created to, you know, demonstrate some concept about space science or actual space photography from some of the satellites and mixed with a lot of drone footage of places all over the planet, all over Earth, um, that a friend of mine, Philip Whiteman, had, uh, has been collecting kind of over years. He's mm-hmm. done a lot of drone photography. So it's sort of a mixture of all these space surreal landscapes mixed with similar looking surreal landscapes that are actually exist on the planet. So what made you decide to make an album along this theme? What makes a composer in particular decide one day, I'm going to make an album? I think for me, I mean, I had this idea for this project for a long time and the whole process took about... A little, maybe a year and a half from kind of like, okay, I'm going to do the album that I've been wanting to do until I had it in my hand. I've come from film music, more specifically, that kind of film music has sort of brought me into composition rather than the other way around of sort of studying classical composition then discovering film music. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, that's always been kind of my focus and my, uh, my goal, but in doing film music, it's always a collaboration, just like if you were doing an opera or a ballet or something. And when you're collaborating, it's not fully yours, yeah. uh, you know. So you you have to make concessions, and uh, it's not not in a bad way. But that's what a collaboration is: is you're taking and pulling from other people, and they're pulling from you, and you're inspiring each other. So you know, doing your own album is the only chance you have to really. <laughs> do something that is completely your own. You know, I mean, in a similar way, maybe to concert music, you lead the story, you know, you create the entire concept and you present it. And I think that's where I could really present, like, this is who I am and this is what I do. Mm -hmm. This is what I sound like. Yeah, right. Without anything else dictating. Yeah. Your brief. I really just felt the urge for a while to present that. I mean, I felt like it was kind of screaming out of me at a point to... (laughs) You know, like, if these are the things that you love and this is the music you want to make, then you just have to make it. Yeah. Yeah. That's so true. So how would you describe your sound from the album? I think at least what what it is right now, as it's, um, you know, I think you're always kind of, there's a snapshot of who you are, both just as a person, but creatively, you know, this is who I am at this point in time, and who knows who I'll be in 10 years, but... Hopefully you won't cringe when you listen back to it. Yes. <laughs> I think that my sound is kind of what I've been really fascinated by and what I try to achieve with this is a combination of 
textures between both the sort of electronic world and the acoustic and more maybe traditional world. Um, so I'm a huge orchestration nerd. I do a lot of orchestration and I love the details of something, you know, like Ravel is probably one of the best orchestrators who ever lived. Oh, totally. You know what? As from a player's point of view, whenever I play Ravel, I always feel like he's about five steps ahead of me. I get presented with the score and it's got these, all these really detailed instructions on how to play specific harmonics. And I have mm. to think, I don't even know how to do that on my own <laughs> instrument. But he knows. He knows. That's He's, what makes him incredible. Yeah, absolute genius. You know, and I think um, the the French in general, I think, have been the sort of innovators of orchestration historically, Berlioz included. And yeah. So I love that. I think, you know, the first time I discovered Deafness of Chloe was like, it blew my mind. Still, it's kind of my manual for orchestration. Yeah. I can open up any page in that score and find something that I didn't know before or that's really inspiring. So I love that, the acoustic side. And I think that with orchestral music, it's endless. You know, obviously we haven't done everything an orchestra can do still. It's still an evolving art form. But then I think when you take that and consider it from the electronic side, electronic music is like as if all of a sudden we had a whole completely different like alien palette yeah. of sound yeah. that came up. You had hundreds of years of what had evolved to become an orchestra. And now out of nowhere, you have this whole other thing mm -hmm. that is completely separate that is doing the same thing, that is just like a limitless palette. It's like discovering new colors if you're a painter or something. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I think of it in terms of colors just like that. Yeah. And it's, you know, and with electronic music, what I think is really special about it is the breadth of timbre that's achievable. Because with an orchestra, you know, it's arguably limitless, you know, uh, colors and timbre and that sort of thing. But with electronic music, it's still just... You know, you can't change the way that uh, a cello sounds, mm -hmm. you know, in its kind of like core timbre. Obviously, you can do so much to uh, control the sound of it. Yeah. But you can fundamentally change the sound of things in electronic music. And I think a sound that, wave, basically. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's bending electricity into sound. I guess it's changing the sound, isn't it? To, in a more fundamental way. Yeah, it's, you know, just so inspiring and intriguing to me. And I think so where I kind of, you know, think that my sound is now and is really exploring like the crossover of these textures. Mm -hmm. I like to think in textures quite a lot. And that's what I find really fascinating because it's just like deeper layers and layers of color that you can kind of combine and shape. So, yeah, I think that's maybe like the core of what that yeah. sound is. And what a lucky place to be right now where we're able to explore these two sorts of worlds yeah and we're still very much in the beginnings of it yeah what i loved about your album launch was it was an immersive experience so we had everyone streaming the album through their silent disco headphones watching this footage of space and landscapes but also just sitting in bean bags and I think I said to you in an email afterwards that I almost forgot I was in Covent Garden. I almost forgot about all the ridiculous political events that are happening in the world right now. And I could just immerse myself in this wonderful soundscape. What's your sort of approach in presenting music in this way? Well, actually, I had thought for a while about how to present it because I had my creative mentor at the time, Steve Beckett. He had, you know, asked me, if you're asking people to come out, you know, on uh, a weeknight, why should they come and see your show out of the dozens of other things they could do or they could just be home with their kids? You know, why should they come and spend their time with you <laughs> when you could just send them the music and yeah. they can have a listen? And uh, so we thought about the best way to present that and make it a really unique experience. Um, and then it was actually my creative coach uh, or my um, sort of more business-minded uh, coach um, on the scheme I was on that uh, Laura Hayes, who had come up with this idea of, well, why don't you just do an installation? And then it really kind of took off of, you know, make it an immersive experience. It has to have something where the music is tied to the visuals. It has to be a really unique experience. And then when, as the kind of project evolved, 
with the artwork for the album and where we had uh, all the original artwork on display and made it essentially like a art gallery opening so that it became a really unique thing that you had to be there to experience. Yeah, no, there's no way that you could have experienced it if you were sitting at home yeah. with your kids or your cat. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that was a really nice thing because everyone takes away something different from a sound installation, especially when they feel like they're part of it. You, you know, you might connect more with, say, the visuals or the sound or the, the artwork, mm-hmm. but then you're hoping, I imagine, that this all comes together as one as something unique. Mm-hmm. So that leads me to ask about the music itself and how you've released the album and you've released it on vinyl. So can I ask why vinyl, first of all? So f- sort of from the early concepts um, with my mentor, Steve, we had talked about, you know, what makes this whole project special. It came from kind of, you know, the decision to really be high fidelity the entire way, really spending time crafting the orchestration and obviously, you know, doing the the best I can with, uh, you know, presenting it and, and putting as much detail as I can in writing it. But then um, I recorded uh, Angel Studios and I recorded with the best session musicians there are. It's recorded in the best way. It's sort of captured in the best way it could be. And then going through and mixing, um, mastering, I had Jake Jackson mixed it. And it was mastered through 1087. Um, and they did a fantastic job. And What's it was 1087? Uh, just mastering company. Oh, okay. <laughs> and uh, sorry. <laughs> So I, I knew vinyl was kind of the destination mm-hmm. from the beginning that because we wanted to maintain it as high fidelity and also the presentation of it. I wanted people to actively focus on listening to it, where I think anyway, as far as a physical medium, you know, arguably, I think CD is dead. You know, the I haven't listened to a CD in ages. Yeah. I mean, I have I have CDs. I have a CD player, I think only in my car, but not even <laughs> on my computer and can't remember the last time. Yeah, I, I put one on. Right? I, I think if you're going to listen to music, you're likely going to be listening to it on Spotify or mm. you know any other sort of streaming platform. Yeah. You're going to be streaming digital music. Yeah. If you're going to be listening to music in an analog way, then it's probably vinyl because, mm. I mean, some people are putting out uh, cassette tapes and doing a similar <laughs> thing and being creative. But <laughs> if you're going to put up cassette tapes, you have to supply them with pencils as well. Yeah. So. <laughs> For when they inevitably get tangled up. But I imagine yeah. with vinyl, you have this tangible thing that you can hold on to in your hand. And then it becomes a real conscious, I don't want to say effort because I don't want it to sound like it's a bad thing, but it becomes a conscious thing to actually you know, go through the motions of putting the record on the record player. And Yeah, I think, I mean, that's exactly it, is that I, I love listening to records because it's an activity. You know, you have to choose to pick something. Yeah, there's a sense of ritual with it, isn't there? Exactly. Yeah, there is a ritual, mm-hmm. and it's you can't just like let a playlist run. Yeah. You know, and it's only going to play for 20 minutes, and then you have to go back and give it more yeah, love yeah, and attention. Yeah, yeah, and... yeah, yeah. It's you have to be very conscious, don't you? Yeah. It's not like listening to a Spotify radio playlist on the tube, where you're yeah. just like, okay, this is something to block out the sounds of London in my ears, whatever. I imagine it's, yeah, very much more conscious. Yeah. Yeah. So that was a big part of it. And um, so, and I, and I also thought just from a kind of pragmatic standpoint, you know, to, it's then also a really great way to present it to people. Vinyl is really interesting and it makes people curious. And uh, if you hand somebody your vinyl, they're, you know, really, it, they don't want to throw it away. You know, it's, yeah. you've created a, a product that really, I think in that sense, it reflects the effort that's gone into it. Totally. Yeah. It's almost like a piece of art, isn't it? Yeah. I say almost, it is a piece of art. Yeah. Yeah. It shows in a direct physical way how how much kind of time and energy and uh, effort people have put into something. Mm. Where I think if you just send a link on Spotify, yeah. Then it doesn't uh, it doesn't come across. Yeah, or a we transfer link or something, and yeah. then it, it disappears after seven days. But what do you do about potential listeners that don't have a record player? I mean, I sort of think uh, <laughs> in, get in, one <laughs> in a selfish way. You know, it's <laughs> if you really want to hear it, then that's part of the ritual. You know, is um, I say not you don't have to go out and uh, buy it just to listen to my album or anything, but. 
I have it now available in Fonica Record Shop, and you can stop by in Soho and go listen to it on one of their decks there. And oh, okay. Will they let you do that? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's like a library. It's sort of one of, you know, these amazing still existing record shops that is you can go in and just explore, grab something off the shelf, go have a listen, see what you like. So I think for that, it's great because you can you can have that experience. It's available. And of course, it'll be available digitally at a point and uh, everyone can, you know, stream it and Mm. most people will experience it that that way. But I only want to listen to it if I can watch the visuals of NASA uh. and, and all the landscapes as well. That was a really Ooh. nice escape with a beanbag, yeah. obviously. I guess a parallel is the difference between reading something off a Kindle or audiobooks and having a book. Yeah, and that way, you know, a lot of people really prefer kind of the physicality of it. My husband loves books. He always has a book in his bag and... I think he likes, you know, just being able to put a bookmark in or remember visually where something was said on a page. You might not necessarily get that with an audio book or yeah. a Kindle. Per se, I love my Kindle, but I Do also <laughs> hate, uh, I, I fear having too much stuff since I've, I've moved, you know, nearly every year for the past 10 years. And you're about to move again. I'm about to move again. Yeah, yeah. It's... So I'm, I hate to uh, have too much. There's nothing like moving that makes you realize how much stuff you just accumulate. <laughs> yes. Because hopefully I will be moving in the next few months, but we have accumulated a lot of books. I say we, Mark has accumulated yeah. lots of books. I'm not the best reader in particular but you know what do you do about things that you accumulate such as old strings or something or you know what are some things that you're going to have to think about getting rid of besides a lot of copies of vinyl um (laughs) i accumulate computer parts really because i have built a few of my own work computers and things like that and it so that's one of my how do you know how to do that how did you learn that? The internet. <laughs> Anyone can learn how to put a computer together. That's like said like a true millennial. <laughs> we all know how to find stuff out. Yeah. That's basically how I know how to how to do a podcast is from YouTube yeah. tutorials. Well, good luck with your impending move. Maybe your current flat will inherit some old computer parts. Some things, yeah. All yeah. right. I will look forward to recycling a few things and... Uh, Maybe where uh, other people can use them and repurpose it into making some newer computers or something. Oh, maybe. Well, I have a question. So I've got a terrible computer at the moment, and it is a miracle that I managed to put out a podcast every two weeks because it's so slow. And it's just constantly in a state of thinking. You know how it, – it's not a Mac, but you know how on a Mac you have, like, the rainbow wheel? Yeah. <laughs> it's like it's always doing that, just the cogs are always turning. So can I give it to someone to make it better? Short answer, probably not. You're probably just oh. better off getting something newer. There might be some <laughs> tweaks that you could do to, like, uh, make it more efficient. Oh. But I think the problem, like, with what typically makes, like, your phone or computer slower over time is that – the apps and the things that you use on them become a lot more demanding. Okay. And so if, you know, an app now is utilizes so much processing power, then my poor old MacBook from 10 years ago mm. can barely handle it. And that's what makes it take ages. Sure. And it's obsolescence as well, isn't it? They want it to sort of crap out after a few years so that you upgrade. I, I think it's just that, you know, no one can predict the demands of what uh, computers will be able to do in five years, you know, or even six months from now. It moves so rapidly. So you kind of build the best thing you can. And then, uh, but my, you know, my MacBook Pro existed uh, like when it was born around the same time as Twitter, you know? <laughs> Oh, that's pretty vintage. Yeah. So how, you know, they it didn't, have, it couldn't have predicted Spotify. Yeah. It didn't know what Spotify could be. Was that before the cloud? Maybe, or around a similar time of iCloud, yeah. Yeah. I remember when people started talking about the cloud, and it was this thing. So you don't need to save your files on a on a USB drive. It just goes into the cloud. Yeah. It was definitely <laughs> before Dropbox. All right, yeah. Well, Dropbox isn't something that I use that much, but definitely use WeTransfer yeah. a lot. Oh, it's spooky. Who knows? You know what? I just need to buy a new computer. 
So moving on, you mentioned before you are an orchestration nerd and you've done lots of film composition and orchestration. So do you want to tell us a little bit about some exciting projects that you've done? For example, I know that you were on the team for Ad Astra, Mm -hmm. that new space film. Yeah, Brad Pitt space film. Can you say that Brad Pitt is a colleague of yours now? Uh, probably not, but... <laughs> Distantly. <laughs> we don't know each other at all. <laughs> I orchestrated at Astra, and that was, I mean, a great project. Uh, it was quick. It was a very sort of fast turnaround. Um, How quick is quick? I orchestrated that film in less than a week. <gasps> and, <laughs> and how long is... How many hours of music is there? Or how many minutes of music is there? Um... I don't know, actually. I don't have a total count off the top of my head, but a lot, over an hour, um, probably that's, an hour and a half. That's a lot. How did you get it done in a week? Coffee. Just blaze through it. <laughs> I've I've done a lot of orchestration now for different projects, for different TV series as well, and that sort of thing. But yeah, kind of doing a lot of additional music as well. Um, I work with the composer, Lauren Balf, part of his company, 14th Street Music. We do kind of high output. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of different projects going on. It's it's really fascinating. You so know. when you get given a project, for people who don't know what orchestrators actually do, you get given a project, and is it in a particular form, say, in a piano score or something, and then is it your job to yeah, I'd say with the different instruments of the orchestra? The job of the orchestrator, plain and simple, is you need to take the uh, MIDI or what in whatever form the composer wrote the music mm-hmm. and that music got approved and you need to prepare it so an orchestra can play it. So mm-hmm. you need to turn maybe from you know a handwritten sketch, which is very rare these days, you're mostly getting a sequence from um, a digital audio workstation sequence where the, all the MIDI laid out and you're turning that into notation. So that is the role, plain and simple. What you are responsible for delivering is scores and parts. Has the composer told you in particular, I want this on this instrument? It's in the MIDI, you know, so okay. it's sort of, you know, you'll have, uh, you open up the sequence and there's your strings laid out on... Oh, synthy strings. Like, yeah. Yeah. Uh, samples. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, in the mock-ups sound you know usually amazing because Mm -hmm. it's kind of required to have a pretty much finished product to be demonstrating to the director or the producer so that they can approve it and then once they approve it that's what they expect it's going to be in the end Mm. and you know then the reason we record the orchestra is to obviously do it right and to make it sound better yeah it's just to give Uh, that human element (laughs) to yeah yeah. um so the demo can only ever do so much but It gives the director producer an idea of, you know, what it is and they you can kind of tweak and have full control over the end product before you go to record um, because obviously the recording time is the most expensive component. Totally. So, yeah, your job is to then turn it into notation for the recording session and to do that. So the recording session is as efficient as possible. And I'm often then... If I orchestrate something, I'm usually the one producing the recording session. So I'm deciding if we got the right take and if we can move on and making sure we get all the music recorded. Yeah. I imagine it's seeing things from the performance point of view as well, being able to understand what you've written Mm -hmm. in the notation. I have definitely worked in sessions when the parts have not been prepared properly. Like they might be lacking, say, bar numbers or... Oh, that's unacceptable to say the least. (laughs) I, it's, it's just making sure of these little things, right? Yeah. Well, I, I learned from the best. Uh, Jean Stefan is an amazing orchestrator, uh, a good friend. And he, you know, I think from him, it's 110% minimum mm. is, you know, mm. you perfection is needed. Yeah. Especially if recording time is so expensive, you yeah. cannot afford to waste a single second. Yeah. Yeah. It's so when you get questions from various players being like, I have a particular marking in my score. I don't know what this means. <laughs> yeah. In concert music, you know, you have a lot of time to, because you get to rehearse. Mm, in collaboration. Fi- yeah. In film music sessions, the musicians are reading the music for the first time ever. Yeah. And they might read it down twice and you move on. It just has to be efficient. You just have to have the only the necessary information on the page. And uh, so I think the more I've orchestrated, I've also learned a bit more of like what to trust the musicians with. And, 
you know, there's certain scoring stages that we work with too. And I can kind of understand where if we're recording in London, these are the best players in the world who they, you know, there's a lot of trust that you have and you know that they're going to interpret things in a certain way. Mm. It must be fascinating watching from the booth, the players. Yeah. I mean, what's fascinating is hearing it played down perfectly on the first read. (laughs) And then you just get a second take uh, for coverage, you know. So let's move on. I mentioned to you that there'd be some surprise questions. Here we go. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I just love seeing people's reactions. Mike has just smiled at me silently. (laughs) Usually people go, oh, oh, no. But it's fine. They're harmless. So this is the wild card question round where you get to choose what I ask you next. Okay. So we have, finish the sentence, compositional subjects and alternate paths. Ooh, Hmm. alternate paths. That could be anything. Well, (laughs) well, yeah, basically with wild card questions, they could go anywhere. Um, Let's go with that. Okay. It's actually not that exciting. If you weren't a musician, what would you be? My first instinct is chef. Really? Um, I've thought long and hard about this. <laughs> uh, Especially with that quick fire reaction. Yes. My my mom's a chef, uh, retired now, but I loved cooking. I, really? I love it. And I find it so, you know, I'm not the first to say this. It's so similar to composition in mm-hmm. a lot of ways, you know, of how you're kind of constructing something. And yeah. But anyway, I love cooking. I love cooking as well. I love the process, actually. Yeah. I love organizing, doing all the prep. If I have the luxury of time, which I don't always, but I like going with something and then yeah. creating something delicious from that. I, I love making, when you're cooking for a kind of a large group of people mm-hmm. and you have to do a lot and you time everything so that it's all finished perfectly at the end. Wow. That, I feel like that would stress out a lot of people, but... That doesn't stress you out? No, I love it. I think because it makes me focus. Yeah. And I find that, like, there's sort of that and discovering new music for the first time, like listening to something I've just never heard of, mm. are some of the only things where I'm completely focused. And right, yeah. um, because otherwise, my mind is always moving and thinking about some melody or something I heard or, mm-hmm. you know, you can never, like, turn the tap off. Right. And so those are the things when it like pushes whatever else is going on out of the way mm-hmm. and I can just focus. So I love it. That's how I feel about climbing. Actually, I can't focus on anything yeah. else because if I don't, then I might fall off a wall, <laughs> which is, is not uh, desirable. What was the last thing that you cooked? I'm trying to think of a like sort of a proper meal. Well, I think just chicken soup the other day. Mm. Um, and were you ill? In uh, No, just just autumn. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And uh, made it in the Greek style. Oh, yeah. Well, how, how's, that, how's it Greek? You uh, take... It's with lemon and eggs. Eggs? And so you take uh, egg yolks. Uh-huh. And uh, say for a big pot, I think we did maybe three egg yolks uh-huh. um, and three lemons. Um, and you mix that together. And then you take slowly the sort of hot broth mm. from the soup. And you add it to the eggs until they're the same temperature. And then you add that back into the broth. So then the eggs don't curdle. Okay, sure. And you're tempering it, yeah. Yeah. What's the texture like? Um, it, it just makes it, it's quite... Um, is it emulsified? Yeah, it's it's like creamy. It's silky. Oh, yeah. oh, that sounds really interesting. I it's did really nice. kind of freak out when you said eggs at first. But then I thought, you know, there's that really common Chinese soup, sweet corn and, and chicken soup. Yeah. Well, I think some people call it egg drop soup, where you add the eggs into the hot broth, but then it becomes ribbons of eggs. Mm. So you you kind of get these these chunky strands, mm. but that sounds quite different. Yeah. That sounds really nice. It is really nice. That with some orzo, vegetables. That's oh great. God. That sounds really good. It sounds especially good for this time of year, especially yeah. when everyone is getting really ill. And what other kind of things do you like to uh, cook? Italian food. Yeah. Come on. Everybody loves Italian food. Yeah. You can't go wrong. Yeah. Do you make your own pizza? I have. Mm-hmm. It's sort of, unless you have like a proper oven yeah. uh, and the the right equipment, it's a bit more difficult. But I used to make a lot of like focaccia and stuff like oh, that. Yeah. Not a baker. Baking is science. Baking is science. <laughs> That's the different thing, isn't it? I 
guess when you when you were talking about the parallels between composition and cooking. Yeah. Cooking you can improvise a little bit and you choose from your palate that is available. But with baking you have to get everything really precise. Yeah. Don't you? I leave that to pros. <laughs> <laughs> so is it like writing a four part fugue or something? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You're obviously going to have to cook a massive dinner for me when I come visit you at your new place. Absolutely. Yeah. Where I'm moving in with two Italians, so well. Excellent. What's on the menu? <laughs> Whatever you'd like. Pasta, please. Yeah. Pasta's a favorite. Yeah. Maybe some aubergine. Yeah. Mm. That sounds good. Something fresh. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. No problem. So where can people find out more about your work, your album? The vinyl is available at Phonica Record Shops, uh, which can also be purchased online. Mm -hmm. um, and that's and, in London. Yep. Sorry, uh, but a lot of Londoners. <laughs> they ship internationally. Um, although, depending on where you are, the shipping might be more than the cost of the album. But <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. um, They've got some snippets of the music on the site as well, so you can get a preview. And then, hopefully soon, um, I will have more information about uh, digital distribution. Um, so that is in the works, but coming soon. Mm -hmm. um, and then eventually it will be available streaming everywhere. And the visual album that we've uh, discussed and tantalized you with will also be available likely just on YouTube to be able to listen digitally and watch with the visuals accompanying it. And BYO beanbag. Yes. <laughs> Can't do it without a beanbag. So uh, there will be also be a, a single coming out soon. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thank you for having me. That was Mike Ladisser. If anyone can hook me up with a record player, let me know, because Mike gave me a beautiful copy of his album, and I'd like to anticipate another duvet day wrapped up in snuggly burrito low-power mode listening to the record. Though I might need someone to flip the vinyl over for me if I'm incapacitated in my wadge of duvet. This week's Music College Didn't Prepare Me contributor wishes to remain anonymous. I love this. It's like a confessional. <laughs> I was tutoring a youth orchestra concert playing the Firebird Suite by Stravinsky, and the audience was obviously full of parents and extended family. If you know the suite, you'll know that the princess's rondo lulls to a quiet conclusion, before a sudden bang as the infernal dance begins. If you're not expecting it, it will catch you off guard. As it did with one poor granny who screamed. After the initial shock, we could then hear her go, Oh... Oh, uh, oh, oh no. Followed by the woman sitting next to her saying, Oh, Jesus. Oh, God. Mum, what have you done? Somebody get me a coat. Turns out the poor granny had shat herself in the audience, and this was confirmed once the smell had reached us performing on stage. Oh, I may have just given away where this person's from. <laughs> I mean, no good, no good. I will say at least it's a testament to the power of that youth orchestra. That musical moment can truly be one of the most shocking entries in symphonic repertoire. And so I guess you can't argue that they didn't pull it off. But imagine sitting next to or behind that poor lady. Oh, and there's still quite a bit of the suite left after that movement, <laughs> in all senses of the word. Oh, if you have an experience that music college didn't prepare you for, then tell me. You can email me at asitcomespodcast at gmail.com or on the old social media. Or write me a letter. N no one writes letters anymore. A friend wrote me one a couple months ago, and it was so lovely to receive. A bit like what Mike and I were talking about with vinyl versus digital. You don't want to throw it away. But also, I understand if you don't have time to do that. That's it for today. Special thanks to Ros Nagy for my logo and Daniel Elms for my jingle. High fidelity thanks to Mike Ladisser for chatting to me for this episode. And thank you for listening. Amazing if you've made it this far. Pass the poo story. Well done. Do get in touch at asitcomespodcast at gmail.com. Like and follow the podcast on Facebook and Instagram at asitcomespod to keep up to date and for bonus material such as cats and my talking face. Remember to rate and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts and spread the word. I'm a freelance toasty burrito and I'll chat to you soon. Bye. Bye.